cultural planning. Is this all getting through? Can somebody just give me a, a nod um, or a smile? Is this getting through to you? Yeah, we're okay. All right, good. Um, okay. Yeah, um, I could see in, in your heading, actually, you've used the word artistic planning or artistic town planning, and maybe that's a better alternative to cultural planning. However, it's not so much the name that matters, maybe about the approach, what it is, and why we are still convinced that this is, even perhaps in these times, more, um, uh, more a more convincing and a more sustainable and a more perhaps humble way of looking at how we look at so-called planning cities. I think particularly the last few years have underlined the fact that we as human beings are not in control of everyone, all the time, all the places. On the contrary, we seem to be in a, in a situation where it's not a question of planning five, 10, 15, 20 years, but surviving. And it's also a question of perhaps not determining and know exactly what we want or what we need, but working together in a more of a collective way, a collective system, and having a shared response and a shared responsibility to situations which feel perhaps out of our control. And I just thought that this is, you know, while we've been through a two or three lockdown, how this has changed our perception of the way we think about being able to control the world or the world, the situation. In this uh, meltdown of human values, where we are again letting confrontation and um, hierarchies and structures create unstable situations, and how issues which suddenly burst through human based issues, which can be Black Lives Matter, which can be Me Too, or which there are other kinds of things which somehow destabilize how we have constructed the world we live in. And it's, so cultural planning in a way questions these very, the very determinist and the very secure way we have always believed that we are in control. Indeed, the whole ethos is planning is the more distant you are to something, the longer perspective, the more one feels as though this is the way we ought to work with our lives, with our, um, uh, with our companies, with our institutions, and with our cities. But this way of thinking is time and time again, proved to not be either realistic, nor perhaps delivering the kind of things, the kind of cities in this context and the kind of societies we had hoped for. In a way, you can say that the 20th century has been a century where we, on the one hand, were always talking about utopias, the utopians which were we the, imag the imagined, but increasingly also managing the dystopian, the, ac the actual reality. And in a century which has like oscillated going between both this utopian fascination and the dystopian discourse is been a major concern. <clears throat> um, so in a way you might say cultural planning is starting at a very humble, starting at another point, which is perhaps the human, the human being or the human needs and starting in with neighborhoods and streets and small collections and not regions or nations or European regions. So this in a way, you know, I'm just saying this is a kind of prelude to the presentation. This is being underlined in the realities we're talking about and in this super hyper reality of a, of a melting globe in which biodiversity and resources are being exhausted in the uh, search for growth, wealth, and well-being. So I think, it, 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 you know, in, in a way, although cultural planning has been around for a long time, um, I think particularly in this period, 
the, 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 the reason and the need for taking another stance and looking again at how we approach very complex systems, which cities are, and very complex situations uh, and very complex times, we perhaps need to find a kind of another way, another looking glass, another telescopic approach. Um, so that's kind of just a prelude about how I feel about it now. Um, and if you look classically at what cultural planning is, it has these five, you might say, perspectives, which are really important, which underline what I've been saying in a way or, or focus on some of the things. Uh, one is that it is a cultural and arts-led approach. It's not a, an infrastructure approach. It is a humanist approach, putting the human and the humanistic, you might say, perspective at the core, putting our bodies and our senses at the core. It's an integrated approach, and this integration means not only about how we think of um, our everyday, but it also means about how we look at the departments involved in city making or creating, that it is not a di divided into sectors or divided into responsibilities. We have to think integrated. And the fourth thing is, which I've also sort of underlined in this, in this kind of uh, intro, is that it's flexible, is that we just don't try to see how we get to the plan in five or 10 years, and the design is what we keep to 100%, but it acknowledges that times change, people are different, and situations arise, that it's flexible to include and not to exclude. So you have to clue, include time and include different situations. And is it, it is democratic, not so much in a, you might say, in a political democratic where democracy, where representation is the key, but in the way that it is about doing democracy rather than talking or voting democracy. The democratic is part of the taking part is essential to the, to the to philosophy. So those things are really, uh, really key. Um, and this is, uh, this kind of, uh, this kind of um, standpoint has been there for many years, but perhaps the way we do it is, is changing. And in this period when we're re-looking at what cultural planning might mean in the contemporary text here is, um, is, is, is kind of important. So cultural planning has been used in different ways. Um, I think I'll start at the bottom of the page actually. Uh, my, own, my own kind of approach has been very much through the European capital, capital of culture. There are some deliberate mistakes in this. So. You should find them if you're reading it. Uh, anyway, um, so uh, because in a way, working with events or programs like the European Capital of Culture put the context of change, which is why most cities want to be involved in this, in another context. It's not responsibility of the city, but the project. It means you are free of perhaps uh, some political some administrative, some other kind of barriers, which allow you to find new approaches. So it's in situations like this, in which it's possible to curate uh, processes and mix methodologies, which cultural planning has always been very useful. But it's always been, it's also increasingly useful in neighborhood approaches, which is the, which is, you might say, looking at it formally has been the perhaps the most successful of the approaches. And if you look at the different European programs on uh, Urbact, for example, and others, you can see many examples where some of the methodologies of cultural planning have been used because you do have this small scale engagement. But it's also uh, been looked at um, on formally for whole cities as a kind of a scenario planning methodology. So in the kind of situation where it's before the real plans are being made and decided, looking at cultural planning as a kind of a playground for ideas and a playground for sensing what 
might be possible. And this has also been worked very well. And then it's also uh, driven by, as myself as an example, of people who are engaged in the cultural sector, but feel that the way they're working has a social relevance. So looking about how to engage as an artistic producer or cultural manager of whether these are theatres or museums, or museums or whatever, how to actually go beyond the boundary of the museum or the concert hall or the festival and actually engage with society. And there again, cultural planning can be a, a useful bridge to the everyday. Yeah, I mean, I've basically said, said this, but just bang on, you know, bang on the headline that the, um, so it's looking at a, as a city as a cultural phenomenon, which I think is really important that we don't, the citizens basically have to re-engage or see the city as their city. I think this is really fundamentally important that the city is a complex cultural phenomena in which the infrastructure and the form and the architecture is part of it. But there is also the, the values, the beliefs, traditions, symbols, stories, processes, networks, the communication, which are really also just as important. And whether one comes first or the other, it doesn't really matter, but it is, of course, totally integrated. So our approach is that we, you might say, take these as the starting point for our analysis, our understanding, our proposals. And why this has been, um, um, of course, this offers, this approach offers in a way, a kind of counterpoint to a, a normal technocratic, um, technocratic and also, um, yeah, way of departmentalizing our cities and departmentalizing our lives as such. And that seems to be the period which is over in the post-industrial, or you might say even the post-human. Uh, I don't mean to say that we're into uh, uh, non-human, but we are definitely into a sort of a, a larger understanding of what, what human might be, is that it's, it's, it's really important to, uh, to look at how you can relate in a new way to the city and this wave of the Occupy movement, pop-up architecture, social activism, and all these kinds of things, do-it-yourself urbanism, is really, really um, uh, thriving. And that is, of course, in a, in a signs of hope and signs of also desperation as to the way it has been going from the 90s and the zeros, the kind of privatization of the public and looking at the city as a commodity, looking at it as real estate and looking at it as something in the global game. So this is putting itself between these two uh, very, very different scenarios. And as I said, maybe we should question this word of planning. It's always done in a kind of a provocative way, planning. So I keep the word cultural planning in mind terminology but at the same time it is quite provoking because actually we're talking about change and we're not talking about planning for we're perhaps talking about transformation or adaptation so we also have to think of the term planning must be interpreted in very many different ways and not look strictly as a kind of a, a single time-based narrative but as a variety of interrelated opportunities and decisions. So it is about managing in the unpredictable and the unsure, where we must say, we, I, the committee, the, the office, the bureau, whatever, the company cannot decide everything because we're all dependent on each other and the unknowns are outweighing the knowns. And when we get in situations where the unknowns are outnumbering and outweighing the known factors, we have to talk about risk. And we have to talk about a different way of also relying on what we maybe cannot rationally say 
is the right decision. Maybe we have to say we feel that it's right even. Maybe we have to say that we sense it's right. And we're not saying that you make the right decision for the next 100 years. Maybe you have to accept that you have a decision and you review it every two years, every five years, every 10 years. So these scenarios of looking into the future as something which is in scope in hundreds of years or centuries is perhaps something completely out of the window. So I think, you know, whether we're uh, talking about sustainable global models in which we're saying we have three years to change the course of the world, we're really accepting that things are imperative now. Things have to change now. And there is no distinction between, you might say, global policies and individual behavior. So I think uh, looking at planning and looking at how to manage in those kind of situations brings it really down to the, you might say, the nitty gritty, the local, the here and now. And how can I do this when I walk out of the room? What can I do to do this? So we're kind of looking at this in, you know, in this, in this very complex situation as something we have to rethink of how we you know, make matrices, matrix and plans to, to adapt and to manage in these situations. And humans are incredibly good at that. Systems are very, very bad at this. Um, so this is why this reliance on the human, the individual, the groups, the citizens and whatever has to really believe that, um, that they are, you might say, mm, every day is the guiding thing. So this is just another way of saying what I've been saying kind of thing, but we better move on. So in this, there's a, there's a little diagram, which is maybe interesting to look at. Um, it has two axes. On the left, this axis I've been talking about, you know, and when I went into cultural planning as a, as a student in 1907, no, God, it was even before that, 1968, we were already questioning whether the controlled and the plan was the way to go. But that's the way we kind of were learning. But now the, the philosophy on the right hand side is very much to look at things which are very much more about interventionistic, to make interventions and participation led. So going from one to the other. And if we're looking at how we are thinking about planning or adapting or engaging, um, on the bottom, we have the infrastructure. There are three plan There are three mistakes in that, actually, which is also quite beautiful because it shows that you can do have three mistakes, but actually you can still understand, which is also in itself a kind of small philosophical lecture. Anyway, we have uh, in infrastructure led, and on the top, we have the human and culturally led. Now, traditional planning has always put itself in this kind of sector. You know, we were planned and controlled and we were led by infrastructure. Cultural planning is placed basically in this segment. It's led by humans and under, in a cultural context and it's based on uh, ongoing interaction. And if you look at all the events and all the kind of small movements that have been happening the last 10, 15 years, they all, they're all here. They're all in this sector, particularly also the way new media teaches us to engage in the public space, the temporary use, urban exploring, urban interventions, creative city, pop-up architecture, urban gardening, all these kinds of things are about this. And this is the territory of cultural planning. So cultural planning is not necessarily a, B, C, D, E, it is, a, it is an umbrella of, of, of activities, which all, many of them have the same kind of starting points and many of them underwrite the same principles as I was talking about before. Um, 
if you're looking at this process, I don't know how much has already, you probably all this stuff has been written in your manual because I'm, I'm sure that Leah has already, you know, we've, we've, we've done this before. So she's probably already far ahead of me and has written all this stuff in your manual, which you're getting by the email or the post. I don't know if it happens. So maybe what I'm saying is rubbish. But for those of you who didn't read your manual, uh, we can go over the sort of basic steps. Um, this is this is kind of um, the, the thing which is, 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 is the phases which are usually put into this process, which can last a month and which can also last three years or four years. So this is not about specific time, but it is about phases, steps. And the cultural mapping is, is what most people are really caught into. How do we map? How do we understand our surroundings before we talk about managing them or thinking about the future? The debate and the dialogue about what do these mean? Where are we going? What is it? What is the DNA of this place? Then a process of visioning, a visioning and not just wanting. So how do we vision before we start to say, I want a playground or I want a chair in a public space or I want the litter to be cleaned up or I want this. How do we think visioning out of the box? Then perhaps uh, you know, projects and innovatives, co-creation, designing you might say, then some decisions and then some implementation or grounding, perhaps that also ought to be there, grounding or rooting the project in the everyday. You know, so these are a bit more, and I think also uh, I'm, I'm sure that uh, we're going to go, you're going to go through all this. So I don't want to take up your time in this so much, but to maybe report on the other thing that this is not done in a closed, in a closed kind of format. This is done very much with participants and partners all the way along, and also with stakeholders, councils and boards all the way along. And it's this kind of, this is kind of navigation where you, you, use the, you use the project to pull in and push out. So it's a kind of also a send information out, get response back. It's not having the citizens and partners on the left-hand side where you do a workshop and find out what they want. Then the architects and planners disappear for a year and then they come back to the politicians on the right-hand side and say, now we have a plan and now we have to say, yes, it's actually, the process is put in the middle and the citizens are there all the way along taking part both the one two three four five and the, also on the political so it is a dialogue and it's a dialogical process and it's uh, based on on discussions and relationships so at the same time the process is building relationships building understanding and also building also in competencies and looking for people who will take this vision or this program on afterwards. By engaging people in the process, you are also getting them to commit, understand, engage, and then commit to the longer term. This is a kind of things about, well, what do we need for process like this? I mean, what, are, what, are we, what, are, what do we need to actually engage? So I've, these are a, you know, a number of competencies. I hope the translator is managing. He was a very nice man. And I can't see him now because I'm on the English channel alone, alone. And you are on the German channel collectively together. There might be a few listening and not. But anyway, I hope he's all right. If he looks sweaty or if he's making so many mistakes uh, that he says, slow down, you must tell me or give me a signal. But otherwise, I'm happy to carry on. So it's not because I'm ignoring you, um, Raina. It's because I'm trusting you. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We've lived through, you're about the same age as me. We've lived through tougher situations. Uh, so, um, so this is the, the competences, which I kind of think, you know, and so this is the competence of the actors and individuals. And then we have to find competencies of methodologies, processes. How, you know, what are the tools we're going to use? And Leah has been gathering all the tools from our 
websites and projects for the last two years. So she has them, I think. But then we also need the competencies of communities and citizens. I mean, how do we get them involved? Not just by saying yes or no, or I don't like, but how do we do this? And then we also expect competencies from local authorities, but not the competencies they have perhaps, but in, de in departmental flexibility, responsiveness. So in a way, if this process, if this project is going to work, we need some pro competencies from people who are perhaps not quite used to delivering this kind of thing. And it's because we're all part of the same project and all working together that we need to link and understand each other. So not everything has to be translated as Brenna is doing for me at the moment. So this idea of a common language, a common rhythm, a common page, a common point of departure is really important. So the kind of things that we are flagging up and you know this cultural planning thing, it may be in a way translated locally into these kind of things. But they're all kind of um, within this family of cultural planning. And they all can be used for things which are really um, relevant. Choosing the right approach in a community or for a group of people or to solve an issue is really part of what I would say, curating and understanding the context, the time, the people involved and linking it to the right methodology specifically. So you have some guidelines, but exactly how you do it is very much based on reading the situation and understanding. So what we're saying is this goes one step further than the city community approach, which was like the whole mantra of cultural planning in the 80s, 90s, city community. And we put an extra, like an added factor. And that of course is art and culture. So it's a three-way dialogue. It's a three-way dialogue. And whereas the city is, no, okay, I'll stick to the slides. So this, the city may be planning department, but it's also culture department, social department, others. The community can be many things. It can also be just one, but it is many things. It is not just the council, also the local associations, also the active people and so on. And art and culture can be many things. So when we're talking about making a, uh, a, a process, who are we going to invite to the table? Who are we going to take part? It doesn't have to be everyone, but we should be aware that this is possible. So choosing the right people together is really important. I'm looking at the time and I think I'm gonna to have to close up pretty soon here. Um, uh, Leah, can you just say how many uh, minutes I've got? Or am I already overrun? Seven minutes left. How many? Seven. Oh, okay, all right. So, and when we're when we're doing this, this this kind of what kind of what kind of systems are we are we setting up? You know, we 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 are we have we're maybe looking at formal, but we're particularly looking at informal systems. So maybe we're looking more at how we can create informal systems, which show another way. Um, like we're looking at the what kind of resources are we interested in? Sometimes. We're interested in finance, but often we're interested in other kinds of resources. And the organization, maybe we're looking far more about self-organizing than actually formal organizations. So these partnerships and collaborations will look at perhaps the arts and the cultural spaces as what we often call third spaces. Because if you put a project in an arts context, it gives it a kind of freedom that allows it to, you might, you might say, be something else. Art spaces are safe spaces. They're also, they're also radical spaces. You can do lots of things in art spaces which you can't do in formal spaces. So we're looking at this in, 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 as, as one way of acting. And we're looking at the economy of resources. If you are putting finances into something, this should trigger 
multiple resources. So people's own energy and um, ideas and concepts and whatever. And maybe as a self-organization is we have to accept that people can't say, I'm going to commit for five years. No, it's temporary. It's short time. It's while I'm engaged. It's my summer holidays or whatever. You know, this is also important. So you have to build up different plates, different framework to this cultural planning that doesn't think along really traditional lines with contracts, large budgets, whatever. Maybe that's part of it, but definitely not the whole lot. And then we have to think about how do we nurture these social cultural processes? You know, we need a mandate. Um, we need to link up with people who are, who have, you know, are kind of uh, looking at how to work to reconnect with different departments and all sorts. We have to think about media and communications. We have to think about how to keep uh, processes uh, developing, how to keep the wheels turning. And we have, to f we have to look at opportunities for the longer time, longer term. I think in, in, all, the, in all the kind of projects uh, I've been involved in, it's been really critical to find um, a really clear starting point. And what I mean by a clear starting point is not the fact that, you know, you're, you have a political framework and you just have to do something, but it's about timing. Some places are, are, are really ready to, to actually engage with, while others maybe not. So choosing the right time and the right point of departure as a kind of, um, mm, yeah, as a kind of, what do you call it? You call it a fulcrum, as a tipping point is really important. Or as I call it here, a trigger. What kind of triggers can set these processes going in, 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 in the context of <coughs> cities, neighborhoods or whatever? And this is what we're, we're looking for, something which is visible which is positive, which has a kind of uniqueness, an open structure. It generates added social value, can be upscaled, driven by creative energy and fun. What will engage in that? So these are kind of the checklist. And is in, I put the word, the words cultural acupuncture, which I've been kind of talking about for all my life um, since I was, <clears throat> A kind of a, a semi-failed, well actually I didn't fail, but in a way, um, student of architecture and, and planning. Um, this kind of role of acupuncture is, is symbolically really important because it's not about understanding uh, the whole body. It's definitely not about cutting off your arm or leg, and it's definitely not about um, reconstructing the body. It is about finding through an acupunctural process what kind of movement, what kind of things can you do which actually um, instigate uh, uh, new energy, new blood into the system. So how are we looking at trying to find places which somehow are very, are, are, are key in the makeup of our communities or whatever. Usually there are things like this public spaces, leftover spaces, empty spaces, public art projects, festivals, residences, urban garden projects, memory projects, walking projects, micro grants. I mean, these are often used as change makers, often used at points at which you can start. And basically all of these, <clears throat> they have one thing in common, is that most of them take place in the public space. So when I said before, we're not thinking about infrastructure and we're not thinking about formal structures, but we are talking about how to re-engage the, pu the public and how to re-engage the public in their city. Normally one starts with processes like this in the public space. And this is because in a way, everything gathers in the public space the political, the social, the environmental, the urban, media, 
artistic figures, uh, spheres intact. So it's this, the whole philosophy is very much rooted in the, in looking at the value of the public space as also a public, a public interface in which you are <clears throat> not hiding things, but you are being very open and very inclusive in the way you work with workshops, with debates, with whatever. So this is the, the, the kind of final thing is that why the public space perhaps is, for me has always been the central starting point and maybe the, the final point of these kind of things. Because this is where you are, you might say, re, redefining the DNA of the, the city around the, um, the public space. <clears throat> so whether this is from tourism, where it's from social activism, where it's from new communities or, or whatever, or identity or cultural um, institutions, yeah. it's, this seems to be the problem. So I think that is, hmm, we don't need that. There are some quotes there if you want, I can send those from, yeah. yeah. So I think I'll stop there and this public space thing, actually. Thank you, Trevor. And we will share your pr the presentation afterwards if it's yeah. okay for you as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Ähm, genau, ich würde euch gerne jetzt noch mal einen kleinen Einblick in ein Praxisbeispiel in Kiel geben, ähm, sozusagen auf eine kleine Bilderreise, wie wir einen Cultural Planning Prozess hier in Kiel umgesetzt haben und es soll so ein bisschen zeigen, wie so ein Cultural Planning Prozess aussehen kann. Also Cultural Planning Prozesse können so vielfältig sein, aber es soll so ein bisschen eine Idee geben, wie es sein könnte. Und ich werde zwischendurch immer noch mal kleine ähm, ja, Erkenntnisse, Erfahrungen einbauen. Und am Ende möchte ich auch gerne mit so ein paar Tipps abschließen, ähm, wie oder wie man so einen Prozess starten könnte. Genau, Trevor und äh, wir oder die Heinrich Böll Stiftung, Trevor und wir mit dem Büro Soziale Stadt Garden waren Teil eines Interreg-Projekts ähm, Cultural Planning. Und in diesem Projekt haben wir 2019 mit der Umsetzung des Prozesses in dem Stadtteil Garden gestartet. Und der Prozess hat sich im Endeffekt über zwei Jahre gezogen. Angedacht war er für circa zwölf bis 15 Monate. Durch Corona hat sich dann immer alles etwas verlängert. Und dieser Prozess hat irgendwann von BürgerInnen, die in diesem Prozess beteiligt waren, den Namen Gardenecken entdecken bekommen, den ihr hier auf der Slide seht. Ja, ich war noch relativ neu in diesem, also nicht im Beteiligungsbereich, da in dem Bereich habe ich schon länger gearbeitet, aber alles, was mit Kultur, Kunst, die Einbindung in Beteiligungsprozesse ähm, ja, betrifft. Und wir haben dann damals ähm, ja, öffentlich ausgeschrieben, um eine Künstlerin oder, ein, oder mehrere KünstlerInnen ähm, auszuwählen, die diesen Prozess mit uns gestalten. Und damals haben wir uns dann geeinigt oder beziehungsweise ähm, haben wir dann eine Künstlerin ausgesucht, Nadine Gutbrot, die den künstlerischen Teil des Prozesses geleitet hat. Genau. Jetzt sagt mein PC. Mhm. Okay. Ähm, zur Motivation. Warum haben wir überhaupt äh, mitgemacht? Warum wollten wir so einen Cultural Planning Prozess machen? Wir haben gemerkt, bei klassischen Beteiligungsprozessen, es kommen immer die gleichen Personen. Äh, die Personen, die kommen, repräsentieren auch nicht wirklich den Stadtteil so in Gänze. Und wir haben gesagt, okay, wie kann man eigentlich nochmal Menschen einbinden? Unterschiedlichster Hintergründe, ähm, aber die sonst, genau, die sonst einfach nicht zu den klassischen Formaten kommen würden. Und gleichzeitig wollten wir das auch nutzen oder einer unserer Hauptbeweggründe war auch, die Menschen zu aktivieren, aufzuzeigen, ähm, Möglichkeiten, wie sie ihr eigenes Wohnumfeld mitgestalten können, aktiv zu werden im Stadtteil. Und was auch ein Anliegen war, viele von Ihnen oder von euch kennen ja Garden äh, oder was darüber berichtet wird, ähm, dass wir ganz gerne eine andere Erzählung von Garten haben wollten. Also welche Perspektiven gibt es denn aus dem Stadtteil ähm, und wie kann man vielleicht noch eine andere Erzählung finden? Und nicht zuletzt, wir wollten natürlich auch Methoden des Casual Planning ausprobieren und testen, um Erfahrungen zu sammeln und zu schauen, wie können wir das in weitere Beteiligungsprozesse ähm, einbeziehen. 
Wir haben dann ein Ziel definiert. Ähm, wir haben nämlich gesagt, okay, ähm, wir wollen noch mal schauen, äh, in den Stadtteil reinhorchen, welche Orte gibt es, die, wir, die positiv wahrgenommen werden, welche werden vielleicht auch nicht positiv wahrgenommen und wie kann man diese Orte, die als nicht positiv wahrgenommen werden, ähm, anders besetzen. Ich muss aber auch zugeben, dass dieses Ziel, also wir sind relativ offen an den Prozess gegangen und dass, dieses, dass wir etwas abgewichen sind von diesem Ziel. Wir hatten es am Anfang gesetzt, haben aber auch gesagt, wir gehen nochmal offen in den Stadtteil rein, wir hören nochmal rein, was bewegt die Menschen, was für Themen sind dort. Ähm, genau, wir kommen dann gleich nochmal dazu, wie wir dann weitergemacht haben. Ähm, Trevor hat es ja schon erzählt, es gibt verschiedene Phasen im äh, Cultural Planning. Und wir haben mit dem Cultural Mapping gestartet. Wir haben verschiedene Angebote gemacht vor allem, und haben vor allen Dingen mit, dem, mit Rundgängen gearbeitet. Das heißt, wir haben Soundwalks gemacht, wo wir einfach nur gehört haben. Wir haben Bilder-Safaris gemacht, wo wir Fotos aufgenommen haben. Ihr seht zum Beispiel ein Foto von rechts. Und wir sind Spaziergänge gemacht, haben uns von BürgerInnen durch den Stadtteil führen lassen. Mitzeichnungen seht ihr zum Beispiel auch oben rechts von der Künstlerin oder links, dass wir nach Soundwalks oder nach Spaziergängen auch die Teilnehmer in ähm, Mindness haben zeichnen lassen. Also was ist hängen geblieben? Was haben sie gehört? Was haben sie wahrgenommen? Ähm, wie haben sie ihren eigenen Stadtteil vielleicht auch nochmal neu entdeckt? Ja, und die Phase des Cultural Mapping war eigentlich besonders wichtig, um nochmal zu gucken, wie sieht eigentlich der Alltag der Menschen aus? Wo treffen sie sich? Wo sind die Begegnungsorte? Welche Angebote nehmen sie wahr? Was macht den Stadtteil eigentlich aus? Und alle Phasen des Cultural Planning haben ihre Berechtigung, aber ich würde sagen, es ist eine der wichtigsten Phasen, also wirklich nochmal darauf einzugehen, was ist die Identität des Ortes und gleichzeitig auch die Neugierde der Menschen zu wecken und ihnen äh, direkt neue Perspektiven auch zu zeigen. Also es gab manche, die an diesen Rundgängen teilgenommen haben und gesagt haben, okay, so habe ich meinen Stadtteil noch nie wahrgenommen oder ich bin dort schon, ich laufe dort jeden Tag vorbei, aber das und das habe ich noch nicht gesehen. Also einfach auch die Wahrnehmung zu ändern. Und äh, da vielleicht noch eine Anekdote zu, oder wir haben dann auch statt Culture Mapping, Visionsentwicklung und Designing, also die, sag ich mal, erstmal eher Fachtermini dieser Phasen umgeändert, weil wir gemerkt haben, okay, damit erreicht man vielleicht nicht unbedingt die Leute. Wir haben gesagt, okay, wir wollen erstmal den Stadtteil wahrnehmen, das heißt, unsere Phase hat so ein bisschen den Titel wahrnehmen. Dann in die zweite Phase Visionsentwicklung, wo wir eher gesagt haben, okay, träumen, damit können die Leute vielleicht eher was anfangen und dann, damit wir dann ins Machen kommen. Ähm, ja, und in der Phase war halt auch besonders wichtig, einfach zuzuhören, einfach mit den Menschen oder Räume zu schaffen, ähm, um Vertrauen aufzubauen, Begegnungen zu schaffen, auch unter den Leuten und den Geschichten der Leute zu folgen. Ähm, genau. In der zweiten Phase ging es dann eben um die Visionsentwicklung. Wir haben angefangen mit einer Visionswerkstatt. Danach kam uns leider Corona in die Quere. Das heißt, alles, alles hat sich etwas, ähm, musste, ja, wir mussten flexibel darauf reagieren. Wir sind dann online gegangen, haben also mit, mit Social Media, mit Online-Abfragen äh, geschaut, ähm, was sind so die Wünsche, die Träume, die Ideen von den Leuten im Stadtteil. Wir haben aber auch gemerkt, dass es gar nicht so einfach ist, Visionen zu entwickeln. Also, äh, dass nicht jeder... Manche oder viele können sehr konkret schnell Wünsche äußern, also was vielleicht jetzt in diesem Moment fehlt, aber wirklich Visionen für einen Ort. Deswegen, das heißt, es ist wirklich wichtig, diese, ähm, ja, die Imagination ähm, zu triggern, also wirklich irgendwie fantasievolle Methoden zu finden, ähm, um die Fantasie anzuregen. Ähm, Genau, in der Phase haben wir dann auch gemerkt, und das war dann der Startpunkt, wo wir dann ein bisschen vom Ziel abgewichen sind. Wir haben gemerkt, dass die Leute weniger Ideen oder Wünsche, Visionen für Orte konkret hatten, sondern dass es mehr Themen gab, die die Leute bewegt haben ähm, und die immer wieder aufgetaucht sind. Und das waren dann zum Beispiel Themen wie, dass sich die Leute mehr Grün und mehr Blumen gewünscht haben, mehr Respekt, mehr Miteinander untereinander oder mehr Sicherheit. Darauf, das haben wir dann aufgegriffen und haben das durch Künstler, verschiedene künstlerische Methoden ähm, dann sichtbar gemacht, ähm, wollten aktiv werden ähm, genau, und haben mit verschiedenen KünstlerInnen ähm, dann auch in dem Rahmen zusammengearbeitet 
Oben links seht ihr zum Beispiel einen Rundgang zu mehr Grün, der von einer Bürgerin angeleitet wurde. Wir haben aber auch Workshops gemacht mit Stencils zum Beispiel oder Kokedamas, um zu, um zu zeigen, ähm, wie könnte man den öffentlichen Raum noch begrünen oder aktivistisch ähm, tätig werden. Ähm, wir haben zum Thema mehr Respekt, haben wir, das seht ihr oben rechts, ähm, Calligraphy workshops gemacht, um einfach Botschaften für mehr Respekt auf Plexiglasscheiben zu bringen und dann an Häuserwänden anzubringen, also auch sichtbar zu machen in den Stadtteil zu tragen. Für mehr Miteinander haben wir Geschichten gesammelt im Stadtteil und haben die von mit Kindern und Jugendlichen in kreative Form umgewandelt. Also da kamen kleine Sketches bei raus, Musikstücke. Hier auf dem Bild links unten seht ihr ein äh, Kunstwerk von einem, einem Jungen, der ja, dann Geschichten aufgegriffen hat und in ein Kunstwerk umgesetzt hat. Und wir haben zum Thema mehr Sicherheit, haben wir nochmal einen Rundgang gemacht, haben geguckt, wo sind denn diese Orte, wo, man, wo sich Leute unsicher fühlen und haben dann Lichtobjekte gemeinsam gebaut und die an diesen Orten platziert, um einfach dort ein sicheres Gefühl zu geben. Genau. Also man sieht, es gibt verschiedenste Arten, Themen künstlerisch aufzugreifen. In diesem Prozess war uns, weil eins der Hauptanliegen eben auch war, ähm, zu aktivieren, dass alle sehr partizipativ waren. Also immer mit der Mitgestaltung, Einbindung der BürgerInnen vor Ort. Und dann komme ich auch schon zu den Haupt-Learnings äh, ja, und gleich den Tipps und möchte nochmal auf den Begriff Kunst und Kultur eingehen. Ähm, weil ich glaube, eins der wichtig des wichtigsten Learnings oder der Erfahrung von mir war auch so, zu sagen, wir suchen nicht Lösungen durch die Kunst ähm, oder Kunst und Kultur liefern vielleicht nicht unbedingt die Lösung, aber sie können eben provozieren, sie können Diskussionen anregen, ähm, sie können sichtbar machen, ähm, Aufmerksamkeit auf Themen lenken, die vielleicht ja bisher unangesprochen geblieben sind oder wo vielleicht auch wenig Kommunikation darüber stattgefunden hat. Es kann Möglichkeiten zeigen, wie Orte zum Beispiel umgenutzt werden. Das seht ihr zum Beispiel unten links mit einer Teppichaktion, ähm, wie in Form vielleicht von Installationen, Pop-up-Events, temporärer Nutzung oder Bespielung. Ähm, und was Kunst vor allem hat, ist eine andere Ansprache. Also wir haben einfach gemerkt, dass die Künstlerinnen einfach nochmal ganz anders auf die Menschen oder durch die Aktion ganz anders auf die Menschen zugehen und eingehen konnte, als wir es vielleicht jetzt mit klassischen Beteiligungsprozessen vorher gemacht haben. Genau, und damit komme ich eigentlich schon zu den Tipps, wenn ihr jetzt sagt, so, ach, das klingt ja eigentlich ganz interessant, aber was sind so die wichtigsten Punkte oder was brauche ich für einen Start? Wie kann man so einen Prozess initiieren? Und eines der wichtigsten, finde ich, ist, ähm, ja, ein gutes Team zusammenzustellen. Am besten mit verschiedenen Kompetenten. Ähm, vielleicht hat eine Person schon Kontakte zu Kreativen oder zu KünstlerInnen, mit denen man zusammenarbeiten kann, schon Ideen, wie man diese einbinden kann oder was, diese, was die KünstlerInnen vielleicht aufgreifen können aus dem Stadtteil. Es braucht aber auch mal jemanden, der sich vielleicht um Administratives kümmert. Das war ich oft in diesem Fall, wenn es um Anträge geht, um vielleicht die finanziellen Ressourcen zu bekommen. Genehmigungen einzuholen oder ähnliches und ganz wichtig eben auch die Kommunikation in den Stadtteil, also verschiedenste Kanäle zu bedienen. Und natürlich ist es immer einfacher im Team oder schöner im Team, als alleine so einen Prozess zu starten. Dann ist es wichtig, klare Ziele zu setzen, also wofür möchte man eigentlich den Cultural Planning Prozess machen. Wie gesagt, bei uns war es sehr offen, wir sind sehr offen reingegangen äh, und ich würde, wenn ich es jetzt nochmal machen würde, wirklich einen stärkeren Fokus setzen. Also geht es um einen bestimmten Platz, geht es um eine bestimmte Nachbarschaft, die ich mit so einem Prozess weiterentwickeln möchte. Ähm, oder geht es um ein Konzept, möchte ich vielleicht ein Kulturkonzept für, ein, für eine ganze Stadt oder einen bestimmten Bereich äh, entwickeln. Also das sollte von Anfang an klar sein und auch von allen der, oder dem Team oder der Gruppe, die so einen Prozess initiiert, dieses Ziel sollte auch geteilt sein, also dass es da nicht noch Unstimmigkeiten gibt. Dann ganz wichtig finde ich auch Organisationen, Initiativen und Akteuren rechtzeitig einbinden. Also zu schauen, wer ist bereits da oder wer, ist, wer nutzt den Raum vielleicht schon oder wer ist in dem Bereich, Bereich bereits tätig. Ähm, Akteure wollen gerne von Anfang an mitgenommen werden und sie genießen halt oft auch nochmal ein ganz anderes äh, Vertrauen bei ihrer Zielgruppe. Also sie haben schon den Zugang, das heißt, das erleichtert die Durchführung solcher Prozesse ungemein. Und vielleicht 
Im besten Falle gibt es vielleicht sogar eine Steuerungsgruppe oder man bildet eine Steuerungsgruppe mit Organisationen oder Initiativen, die diesen Prozess begleitet. Das hebt dann den Prozess einfach nochmal direkt auf ein ganz anderes Level. Ja, dann wie immer gute Kommunikationskanäle wählen, ähm, angepasst an die Zielgruppe, die man erreichen möchte. Ähm, genau, von Anfang an zu gucken, wir haben erst im Laufe des Prozesses angefangen, Online-Kanäle aufzubauen. Das ist natürlich besser, wenn man es von Anfang an hat. Ähm, aber wir haben auch gemerkt, man kommt nicht drum herum. Direkte Ansprache, zumindest war das das, was bei uns sehr wichtig war, und über Multiplikatoren zu gehen. Klar, nicht zu vergessen, finanzielle Ressourcen sollten vorhanden sein. Und bei dem Zeitraum, Java hat ja erzählt, es kann von drei Monaten bis drei Jahre dauern. Ich würde trotzdem noch mal sagen, bei uns hat es zwei Jahre gedauert. Ich würde es eher kompakt halten, damit die Energie in dem Prozess oder zwischen den einzelnen Phasen nicht verloren geht. Das kann dann trotzdem einige Monate oder vielleicht auch bis zu einem Jahr sein, aber dass ja, da nicht zu viele Lücken sind. Und gleichzeitig müssen natürlich die Beteiligten ähm, genügend Zeit haben, um daran überhaupt teilzunehmen oder eben auch bestimmte Aktivitäten zu planen. Ja, das sind so meine Tipps noch für den Start. Und genau, ich hoffe, ich konnte euch damit so einen kleinen Einblick oder eine etwas konkretere Idee geben, wie ein Cultural Planning Prozess aussehen kann. Ähm, wie gesagt, die Anwendemöglichkeiten sind vielfältig, genauso wie die Kultur- und Kunstformen, die in so einen Prozess eingebunden werden können. Ja, damit möchte ich auch schon enden und gebe noch Zeit für Fragen.